Welcome back to Living Proof. Let's go ahead and get started with a word of prayer. Invite the Lord into this place tonight. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your love and faithfulness. We thank you, God, for waking us up this morning and giving us a, a reason to praise you, Lord Jesus, a reason to honor you, Lord. Thank you, God, for giving us the opportunity to come and gather in your name and worship you, Lord. Lord, we love you. We ask that you would send your Holy Spirit into this room and that you would that you would touch us tonight and speak to us, Lord. Speak to us through your word, through the lesson that has been provided ahead of ahead of time, Lord. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name we yes, pray. God. Amen and amen. amen. Would you stand with us if you can?
worship you tonight. You and you alone, Lord Jesus.
for your presence in this place tonight. Lord, we're rejoicing with Peggy as her brother-in-law Steve is recovering after suffering a stroke after the surgeries that he went through. And the doctor said he's doing so well because of God. Lord, we thank you that even the doctors recognize that you are in control. And we are so thankful for this wonderful praise report. Lord, we have needs to bring to you tonight for Peggy's daughter-in-law, Candy, who has a condition that um, is causing her terrible pain in her face. And um, it's also known as a suicide disease because the pain can be so unbearable. Lord, we pray that you would comfort Candy tonight. Lord, touch her and minister your healing. Take away any pain that she's experiencing experiencing now, Lord Jesus, and just touch her from the top of her head to the soles of her feet, bring complete healing. Lord, we're praying for Lauren, who's pregnant, Lord, we just are asking for a safe, full-term pregnancy and delivery, Lord, that everything would go as it's supposed to, and that you would just bring this baby into the world as it's supposed to be, in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray for these others on our list, for Rose with a need for healing of back pain and for uh, Maria's daughter Jennifer who's recovering from gallbladder removal surgery. Lord, we're thankful that Pat Davidson was able to be here with us today as he's recovering from eye surgery. Lord, we're asking for you to breathe your breath of life into Tom's lungs tonight. Continue to minister your healing touch to him and may he just be made new from the inside out in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray for your touch to be upon Herb and the healing of his hamstring. We ask that he would just be completely well tonight in Jesus' name. Touch him even now. We pray for salvation for Gary's brother, Mark, Lord. You can draw him to yourself, Lord. We pray that he would just be around people that would speak your words of life to him and that he would want what they have, Lord Jesus, and that he would come to your saving knowledge. And Lord, we pray for David with stage four pancreatic cancer and Roy who also has cancer and some others, Matthew with serious health issues and Dan with heart issues and Kathy with an autoimmune disease and Eric who also needs healing, Lord. And Michelle needs employment. Lord, you can provide that job for her that she needs. We're asking you to do that for her tonight in Jesus' name. And Lord, we're gonna be careful to give you all the honor and glory as we hear the wonderful reports of, of answered prayer in the days ahead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'm sorry I forgot to have you be seated before we pray. <laughs> Well, we are looking forward to beginning a new series tonight on the non-Davidic Psalms. Those are the Psalms that King David did not write. There were other authors that you may not be aware of, and we're going to look at some of those. And so it's going to be a great series on that book. And uh, next Wednesday, we will not have our service in this room. We will be out on the field for prayer and praise night and a summer connect night, the last one of the summer. And we're going to have a prayer walk. There will be some handouts with topics for prayer as you go around the, the buildings. And if you're not able to move about, there will be chairs out there as well. And we're going to have a great time of worship and then fellowship afterward with some hot dogs and watermelon. So you don't want to miss that. Mm -hmm. If you are planning to go to senior adult camp, just a reminder, if you're going up for the day, yes. that the money is due tonight. So you'll want to see Larry before you leave today. Um, if he's not here, because he may be out in the parking lot, um, you can see me as well and get that money turned in. The cost again is $15 per person, and that will cover your two meals while you're up there. And uh, we do have the bands going up, so um, make sure if you are not paid up, you do that. Otherwise, we're gonna take you off the list tonight because we need to make sure we have enough drivers for everyone who's going. And right now, I think we're, we're kinda iffy. We might need a third band. So um, I believe that's all the announcements I have for tonight. Okay. Well, ushers, if you could prepare to receive the Lord's tithe and your offering. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would use these blessings that you have given us, Lord, 
Lord, we turn these blessings back over to you, and we ask that you would further your kingdom and further your, 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 your spirit, your word to those who need a touch from you, God, who need salvation, who need healing, Lord. We ask that you would use this gift that we gave to you to further your, your kingdom, Lord, to further your glory. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. starting a new series tonight. It is the non-Davidic Psalms, the Psalms in the book of Psalms that were not written by David. These were written by the sons of Korah. They was written by um, Solomon. King Solomon writ, wrote some of these. These are, these are um, Psalms that are not attributed to David. We usually think of King David as the author of the book of Psalms. After all, he wrote some of the most familiar, including Psalms 23, Psalms 51, and Psalms 139. However, many different authors have contributed to this biblical songbook, and all of them were writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So this series of lessons explores a few psalms written by the authors other than King David also making them part, oh sorry, my, my mistake, also called non-Davidic Psalms. Their truths are woven throughout all of scripture, making them a part of a beautiful tapestry of God's work. God's word, excuse me. Let's go ahead and pray, invite the Lord into this lesson. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would that you would speak to us tonight, that you would jump off the page, jump out of your, your, your word, that you'd have your spirit penetrate our hearts, Lord, and that our hearts would then, in tune with our mind, follow after you. Seek what you have for us. Yes. Lord, we love you, we give you this night, and we look forward to what you have in store for us. In Jesus' Great. name, amen. Thank you, Jesus. So tonight, we are talking about the Messiah's universal reign. This is talking about when Jesus has come back and has set up his kingdom. The central truth tonight is the Lord Jesus Christ will rule in truth and justice over all the earth. Amen. Psalms 47, 2 and 3 says, For the Lord Most High is terrible. He is a great king over all the earth. He shall subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. Now, when they say the word terrible, they're not saying, like, in a negative context. Context. It's not in, not in that. It's in the New Living Translation. It says, for the Lord, the Lord Most High is awesome. He is the great king of all the earth. He subdues the nations before us, putting our enemies beneath our feet. Thank you, Jesus. He is the Lord Most High. I I had a, a guy who used to play drums for us at Apple Valley who um, I, I just, I thought the world of, I thought his talent that he brought to the, the table was just second to none. 
And I always told him, man, that was awesome. And he says, no, no, the Lord's awesome. This was just short of awesome. And I was like, yeah, that's right, Sean. It's just short of awesome. Yeah, exactly. And so I picked that up. And I was like, I'm going to reserve the word awesome for the Lord, for the things that he has done. We become, we become consumed with awe in what the Lord has done. That's what the word awesome means. Back when I was a teenager, we were just like, oh, that's awesome. We used to overuse the word but Rich Mullins wrote a song, Awesome God. He wrote, that was something we used to sing in church all the time. You guys remember that song, yes. Awesome God? Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with we. Zoom power and love. Our God is an awesome God. Yeah, we could have sang that tonight. Should have thought about it. Yeah, next week. Yeah, yeah two weeks. <laughs> yeah, it, you know. The Lord is truly awesome. Okay. Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He has conquered death, hell, and the grave, and has been given all power and authority. However, what does it truly mean when Christians say that Jesus is Lord? Sometimes it's easier for us to quote scripture and repeat church concepts than, it, than to identify the practical ways that Jesus is Lord in our everyday lives. When we say the word Lord, when we refer to Jesus, that means in everything that we do, he's in charge. Not me, not my will, not my desires, not my wants, my thoughts, my whatever. I want to go do this. I want to go to Knott's Break Farm. I want to go to Magic Mountain. I want to go to Disneyland. I want to go oh. No. Set that all aside. What does the Lord want? Well, I, I want this really nice house. I want this really nice... What does the Lord want for you? Seek first the kingdom of God, and he will add all of these things unto you. Seek first the kingdom of God, and he will add what you need. Not all of these wants and desires and everything. Ah, I gotta have the latest this and the latest gizmo, and I do not have the latest iPhone. I don't have that because number one, she won't let me buy that because it's too expensive, and she's right. It's too expensive, <laughs> and so I don't get the latest and greatest. I get the cut down version. It's called the SE. It's got the guts of some older iPhone and put into that place, and it's smaller too. So when I open up my phone and I show it to somebody, they're like, your screen is so small. <laughs> I'm like, hey, it's what I can do, okay? But what you need is so different than what we want. i got to explain that to my boys all the time. In what specific areas should Jesus be Lord of your life? Through what behaviors should his lordship be demonstrated? It's important for Christians, not to simply say that Jesus is Lord, but to show his lordship in their thoughts and actions. Ooh, my thoughts as well as my actions. Jesus doesn't have merely religious lordship. Instead, he is Lord over all creation and every part of a Christian's life. That's what we say in tonight. He is Lord. He has risen from the grave. He is Lord. Excuse me. The promise of a Messiah or Savior was something the Jewish people had been waiting on since God's promise to Adam and Eve. God's promise was that he would bring hope and a kingdom unlike any other. His rule would be full of justice and mercy and would bring the sinful world back into alignment with God. Although the Messiah's first arrival may not have happened the way the Jews expected, Jesus is coming again to establish a physical kingdom on earth, and those who worship him now will live with him forever. Is he Lord of your life? My heart wants certain things. My mind has to tell my heart, no, that's not necessarily best for us. The Lord... He looks at us and he says, is that really what you think I want for you? We have to tell ourselves that. The Lord tells us that too. There, there was a, a, a movie that came out a few years back called Fireproof. 
that um, there's a scene in there. It's about a, a marriage. It's about a marriage that's falling apart and how it comes back together. Kirk Cameron's in the movie. Um, but there's a scene in the movie where he's talking to his buddy. That he's a fireman, and his fireman buddy is there with him, and his fireman buddy is a believer. He's a Christian. And he, talked, he talks to the main character, Kirk Cameron, about the heart, how the heart can be deceived. The heart can be deceptive, can lead us astray. We have to lead our heart. We have to tell ourselves, crucify this flesh daily and lean on his understanding. We, do, we, in all our ways, we acknowledge his direction, and his path for us. Okay, part one. Majesty of the Messiah King. Glory to the King. Psalms 45, or Psalm 45, verses 1 through 5. If you have your paper Bible, go ahead and open it up to Psalm 45. I'm going to open up my electronic Bible here. 45. Verses 1 through 5. Now I'm reading in New Living Translation again because that's what I like to do. This particular, uh, this particular psalm, it says, For the choir director, a love song to be sung to the tune, Lilies, a psalm of the descendants of Korah. This is a song not written by David. Beautiful words stir my heart. I will recite a lovely poem about the king. For my tongue is like the pen of a skillful poet. You are the most handsome of all. Gracious words stream from your lips. God himself has blessed you forever. Put on your sword, O mighty warrior. You are glorious, so majestic. In your majesty, ride out to victory. Defending truth, humility, and justice. Go forth to perform awe-inspiring deeds. Your arrows are sharp. Piercing your enemies' hearts, the nations fall beneath your feet. Psalm 45 is considered a royal psalm since it was intended to be used during a royal wedding. During the exile, the psalm was read with hope for the restoration of the Davidic dynasty as promised. Through the lens of this hope, the writer of Hebrews applied this psalm to Jesus directly quoting Psalm 45, 6 through 7. As we talk about this psalm, think about how it applies to the readers before and after Jesus came to the earth. The author of Psalm 45 was a member of the musical guild called the Sons or Descendants of Korah. The author called for the king to take up his weapons and ride out to victory, defending truth, humility, and justice. A primary function of the king was to bring about the justice of God upon his enemies and the rule and rule the people in righteousness. The king himself was supposed to ride out, out to the front of the battle and lead the way. That is what the leader is supposed to do. You, as the leader of your home, men, you are supposed to be leading the way, going after the enemy and riding out victorious. Sometimes we don't necessarily feel very victorious. Sometimes we feel a little worn out. But the Lord said in Psalms, how beautiful is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. And we, I want to encourage you tonight, we are the tabernacle of the Holy Spirit. We, in the New Testament frame of mind, each and every one of us, you have the Holy Spirit. That is the third person of the Trinity. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you. And that psalm says, Oh, Lord, how beautiful your tabernacle is. I'm not feeling very beautiful. I'm not feeling like I can take on the world. I'm not feeling like King Kong tonight. But the Lord already says, that's what you are. That's what you are. You are the tabernacle of the Most High. The king's ability to fight for God's people enabled him to bring peace and prosperity to the nation. 
His battles were intended to defend truth, humility, and justice. He is then described as bringing the nations beneath his feet. The overall purpose of the king was to bless God's people and do his will among the nations. The blessings given to the king mentioned by the author of this psalm could be connected to the kings of the line of David. The psalmist may have been addressing this anointed line of kings and charging the reigning king to rule with the same qualities David possessed. Jesus is king. Psalm chapter 45, we're going to read on, verses 6 through 8. Your throne, O God, endures forever and ever. You rule with a scepter of justice. You love justice and hate evil. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you, pouring out the oil of joy on you more than on anyone else. Myrrh, aloes, and acacia perfume your robes. In ivory palaces, the music of streams entertains you. In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, the author quoted from this song and identified its subject as Jesus. As a king from the line of David, Jesus fulfilled the promises made to David that his throne would be established forever. The psalmist used poetic expressions to describe this great son of David. His vivid imagery brings to mind the glory of the Messiah. The psalmist first recognized that the throne ultimately belongs to God. However, Jesus being the son of God and redeeming sacrifice has earned the right to sit on the throne. Jesus rules as an eternal king who truly upholds all of the laws of God. The psalmist furthered his description by saying the king loves justice and hates evil. Due to his desire for righteousness, God has anointed him more than anyone else. <clears throat> he has given us mercy and grace and justice. He's given us grace. He's given mercy to his people. And in our place, he has put himself and acted on justice and poured the justice on himself. At the cross, everything converged. Our redemption was there. The justice that we deserved, he placed on himself. And he extended mercy and grace to us. Does that make sense to you? Yes. The reference to his robes, spices, and music affirmed that he is being celebrated for his greatness. <clears throat> there, there, there's a denomination called the Church of Christ that doesn't have um, instruments in their churches. They have singing, but they don't have instruments. And in my reading of this text, it says, In ivory palaces, the music of strings entertains you. The musical instruments entertains the living God. So the trumpets, the brass cymbals, the brass instruments, the trombones, the tubas, the strings, the violins, the violas, the violas, 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 violas. I can't say the word. Violas, the, the timpanis, the, all of the different instruments that people play. The oboe, the French horn, the English horn, the, the mellophone. The mellophone is something that you play out in a marching band. The, the, all of the different instruments. The, there are so many different unique instruments. And God has joy in that, in hearing that. Have you ever been to an orchestra concert? Oh my goodness, it is amazing. It's beautiful. When Zach was in, in uh, high school, they had the full orchestra at the time. He was in full orchestra. There was like two or three trumpets and there was flutes and trombones and there were all different woodwind instruments, clarinets and oboe and saxophones and stringed instruments. There were violins, violas, and there was piccolo too. 
There was a whole bunch of stuff. All the different instruments. And it was absolutely beautiful. I don't know how, I, how you guys feel about it, but when I hear strings, it's just, it, it just feel, fills the room. It's just like, oh my goodness, this is warm sound. God finds joy in that too. When you play for him, when you sing, whether it's on tune or not, you make a joyful noise unto the Lord and he has pleasure in that. It may seem harsh to view Jesus as a ruling king that brings nations beneath him, but looking at his character and this poetic description, it is clear that his people love him. Jesus is a king full of mercy and grace and righteousness and justice. Submitting to his leadership brings blessing and hope for an eternal future. Jesus is the perfect king for all eternity. Amen. Part two, Messiah's reign over the nations. Psalm 47, one and two, a call to praise. Come everyone, clap your hands. Shout to God with joyful praise. For the Lord Most High is awesome. His, he is the great King of all the earth. Clap your hands, all you people. Shout to the Lord in voice of triumph. You guys remember that song? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I remember it too. <laughs> kind of. I think I got the words. <laughs> Crystal could correct me later. <laughs> Psalm 47 was also written by a member of the sons of Korah. It's a prophetic psalm with now and later significance calling the people to worship God the Father, but also pointing forward to a celebration of Jesus as the King of Kings. The command to worship Him is given to all the nations of the earth, not just select few. As the idea of Jesus' king, kingship is explored throughout the psalm, it's clear that the reason for rejoicing is God's faithfulness. The command to worship him is given to all nations of the earth, not just a select few. Isn't that interesting? Okay, you have the rapture of the church. You have the tribulation period. Then you have the second coming of Christ. And then you have his millennial reign. Now, there are going to be nations that go through the tribulation period over all the earth. The tribulation period is when God focuses his, his eye on Israel. And there are going to be other nations throughout the earth. Jesus comes back. Every eye will see him. Come back and he will set his foot on Mount of Olives and it will split. Break open. He will stroll himself through the eastern gate. He will march right through. And there is nothing nobody can stop him about. There ain't nothing that anybody can do about it. He's going to march, and he's going to sit on David's throne. And he's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem for a thousand years. That's what the scripture says, the millennial reign of Christ. There will be other nations in this earth at that time. Christ himself will rule over all of the nations, those who are Christian. And those who are not. It says, the command to worship him is given to all nations of the earth, not just a select few. There are going to be nations in this world that don't want to worship him, but they are going to be commanded to do so. Because he is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the prince of peace, the almighty one. The Ancient of Days. In Psalm 47, verses 1 and 2, everyone is commanded to praise God, showing that Jesus' victory and kingship are universal. It's not just in Israel that he reigns. He reigns the entire planet. This entire world, the United States, falls under him. Finally, after... So many years, this nation is going to have to bend its knee to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. Do it now. That way you're not forced to later. Do it now. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for giving me the opportunity to do it now. 
how could we not? We love this guy. He is our God. He is our best friend. He is our king. We love him. He is our provider. He is our savior. He is everything that we could ever hope or imagine. Okay, I'm sorry. The Apostle Paul wrote that at the mention of Jesus' name, every knee would bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. Regardless of race, nationality, ethnicity, or any other construct that may divide people, Jesus is sovereign over all. Over all. No matter if you come from South America or you come from South Africa, or you come from Australia, or anywhere north of that, or even if you come from Antarctica. I can't imagine you come from Antarctica. That place is desolate. No matter where you are at, he's Lord. We must bend a knee. We will, everyone will, bend a knee to the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. Psalm 47.2 explains the reason for the rejoicing. God is described as the Most High. The psalmist's words are translated into two English words with similar meanings. The Most High and Great, meaning awesome and feared. It is awe-inspiring to know that God loved humanity enough to give his Son as a sacrifice. It is humbling to know that he has power to bring righteous justice to all creation. He is great, and he is to be feared. He has all authority, all power, all dominion has been given to him. Everything you can ever think or imagine has been given to him. Even things you can't. All authority. That means he is complete ruler over everything. Over Satan. Over all of the demons of hell. He is Lord over all. Over your lost loved one. He is Lord. What has he done for you? Psalm 47 verses 3 and 4. He subdues the nations before us. Putting our enemies beneath our feet. He chooses the promised land as our inheritance. The proud possession of Jacob's descendants whom he loves. The Apostle Peter charged believers to be ready at any time to explain the reason for their hope in Jesus. It's often a personal testimony, not a well-crafted sermon that initially draws people to Jesus. The people of this world are looking for something to believe in that's powerful, impactful, and authentic. And testimonies are powerful. In fact, they're one of the tools believers use in the book of Revelation to defeat the accuser. The author of Psalm 47 next reviewed some of the awesome things God had done for his people so that they would be reminded of their reason to praise. Do you remember having testimony night? Yes. I remember that too. We had testimony night with, under Tommy Anderson when he was here. He'd have people come up, especially after youth camp. They, all the youth would come out and want to give testimony. And then that would encourage some of us older people to come out and give testimony. What God has done in my life, your testimony, Satan cannot change what God has done for you. And he cannot fight what God has done for you. When God has done something for you, I want to encourage you. Keep a journal. Don't call it a diary. Call it a journal. Open it up and write in there what God has done in your life that day. If you don't have one, start one. What God has done. So a year from now, when you look back and you have forgotten what God has done, you will be reminded this is what God did in my life. This is how he moved in my life. And I remember, I, oh yes, I remember that. Oh my goodness. I, why, oh Lord, I forgot about that. Please forgive me for forgetting your provision. 
Please forgive me for the, the times that I took you for granted. You know, it, it brings you back to what God has done. The Apostle Peter charged believers to be ready at any time to explain the reason for their hope in Jesus. It's their, per, for, per, their, it's their personal testimony. In Psalm chapter 47, verse 3, the psalmist reminded all of Israel that God subdues the nations before us, putting our enemies beneath our feet. Israel was very small compared to the, uh, the countries they had defeated. But by obeying God, they defeated the many inhabitants of Canaan, who had been initially described as giants, giants in the land. The psalmist then reminded Israel that the land of Canaan was given to them as an inheritance because of the promises God made to Jacob. They went in there, they looked around, and they said, oh, we look like grasshoppers compared to these people. We look like a bunch of little ants. They're going to step on us and smash us. There are only two people that came out of that group of 12. The 12 spies that went into the land, there were only two people that came out. Joshua and Caleb came out and said, the Lord has given us that land. The Lord can move through us and conquer those giants. Everybody else was scared. They were scared, scared. They were looking at those people and... There are a lot, of, a lot of people, scholars, that believe and that say that those individuals that lived in those lands that were taller and made everybody else look like grasshoppers, they were like the size of Goliath. They were giants. Nine feet tall, ten feet tall. Those individuals in there, I wouldn't be surprised for one minute that that's what inhabited the place of Canaan. <coughs> Where God said, I have chosen you to dwell in that land and take out those people. A five foot seven guy going up against a ten foot guy? <laughs> that's some guy that's like twice as tall as me. Oh, I get scared too. <laughs> but Joshua and Caleb weren't scared. Oh, shame on me. Joshua and Caleb, they went in. The Lord has given us that land. Christians have the same promises in Jesus. Our enemies, death, hell, and the grave were brought under subjection to Christ, making a pathway for a new life for those who believe in him. Just as Israel was reminded of their reasons to praise God, Christians should also remember the testimonies of countless people who have been given new life through Christ. Death, hell, and the grave are like giants today. They're like the giants of yesteryear. Death, hell, and the grave. Surely, one of these days, I'm going to go and meet my maker. Unless he comes back first. If he comes back first, praise the Lord, I don't have to taste that. But... It is appointed that all man, it is appointed to man that he should die. So that's what we, it's in the future. But if the Lord comes back tomorrow, tonight, if he comes back right now, we don't have to fear that. We don't have to fear that anyways. Jesus has conquered death, hell, and the grave. To be absent from the body is to what? Be present with the Lord. Part three, the Lord is exalted. Give him the highest praise. 47 verses five through seven. Psalm 47 verses five through seven. God has ascended with a mighty shout. The Lord has ascended with trumpets blaring. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King over all the earth. Praise him with a psalm. Praise him with a psalm. With a song. Hebrew, maskil. This may be a literary or musical term. With a song. A musical term. Praise the Lord with singing. Sing praises to our God. God enjoys music. He enjoys it. Very. I enjoy music. I enjoy going down the road and listening to music that most of you probably would not enjoy. I enjoy it. But... 
that's fine. Everybody likes their own. I enjoy music that has a beat and it glorifies my king. I, that's what I enjoy listening to. I've introduced it to Zach, our oldest, when we're driving up and down the hill. The Lord enjoys music, whether it be Southern Gospel quartet music, whether it be gospel music, whether it be what we sing tonight, worship-filled music. He enjoys it, all kinds. Praise the Lord through that singing. Days of before his crucifixion, Jesus said, When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. These words that indicated how he was going to die also bring to mind Old Testament imagery of God ascending in his glory and drawing every eye to himself. After an interlude, Psalm 47 resumes with God has ascended with a mighty shout. The Lord has ascended with trumpets blaring. The Ark of the Covenant represented God's presence, and it was carried before the Israelites when they marched into battle, signifying that God went with them. In an act of worship, after the temple was completed, the Ark was carried up Mount Zion and placed in the most highly place, most high holy place of the temple. Whether they were entering into battle or worship, the one true God was to be lifted above all others. The same is true of Jesus. He was raised on the cross and then ascended into the heavens after his resurrection. Jesus was lifted up, bringing eternal victory for all who believe in him. In Revelation 19, 16, Jesus is given the titles King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He has ascended and will be crowned above all other rulers. Jesus is also part of the Godhead. Beyond Jesus' references to being one with the Father, the Apostle Thomas outright calls Jesus my Lord and my God. Christians must understand all aspects of who Jesus is in their lives. He is not only the Messiah, the great teacher, or the friend of sinners, he is also our God, our master, and the just and righteous Lord. Jesus deserves the highest praise anyone can give because he is all these things and more. He is not just the Lord of lords. He is my God. He is my king. He is my best friend. Is he your king? Is he your Lord? For he is worthy to be lifted up. Psalm 47, 8 and 9. God reigns above the nations, sitting on his holy throne. The rulers of the world have gathered together with the people of God, of the God of Abraham. For all the kings of the earth belong to God. He is highly honored everywhere. When Jesus was physically lifted on the cross, he became victorious over sin. Jesus' victory fulfilled many prophecies and paved the way for all people to be drawn to him, both then and now. God has truly put all things under the authority of King Jesus. The only one who is worthy to be praised. The psalmist finishes his call to worship by declaring that God is the ruler of all, reigning over all nations and their kings from his holy throne. The victory that Jesus accomplished was not just for the descendants of Abraham, but for all people. He exercises his authority to reign over all the nations of the earth, not with the cruel authority of a dictator, but with a perfect love and justice. He is not this guy who comes along and gloats over you and subdues you under his thumb. He is not the God who condemns and says, you're nothing, you're nobody. 
you don't do anything right. You're horrible. He's not that God. My God loves me. My God lifts me up out of the mud. My God embraces me and holds me and heals me and cleans off my wounds. He takes, he goes after that lost sheep. He picks up that lost sheep from a cliff or a ravine and carries that sheep, who's me, on his shoulders and carries me, that sheep, back to the fold. He is a God who is full of mercy, full of love, full of compassion, full of kindness. He is a God and a ruler who extends his hands and extends his love to each and every one of us. He is not a God far away, ruling from some distant world. He is a God who comes close. Because of all Jesus has done in obedience to God, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When we consider the full measure of who Jesus is, and all that he has done, our response should be to praise him with everything we have. Every fiber in our being should praise the Lord. Give him honor, give him glory, just as we did tonight. What is God saying to us? Jesus was not simply a sacrifice offered in our place. He is the Son of God the Savior of the world, the soon-coming King. We must remember that His Lordship doesn't only relate to the areas of our lives that we see as religious, but we should be that He, but He should be Lord of every part of who we are. One day when every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord, how blessed we will be to have chosen Him now. How we truly owe Jesus everything. What better response than to worship and serve him as our Lord. As our King. As our friend. That picks us up and carries us when we can't walk on our own. Evaluate whether Jesus is Lord over every area of your life. Are there areas of your life when you, where you just haven't given it over to God? When you're driving down the road, I mention it a, a bunch of times, and somebody cuts you off, have you given it to God? Is He the Lord of your life? Is He... He's right next to you. He's in the seat right next to you. He's with you everywhere you go. We are the tabernacle of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's with us wherever we go. And whatever we do, is He Lord? When you're at your home and you're flipping through the channels, don't stay on that channel that has a bunch of words flowing across the screen that shouldn't be repeated. Move on. Click that thing off. Open up his word. Turn on the chosen. I enjoy watching that. Yes. Watch it again. You watched it a few times? Watch it again. How many times Christy and I have gone through some series of TV shows that are older, but we enjoy watching them. We've gone through them like three or four times. The chosen is one of them. We go through it. We enjoy watching Open up your word. Like I've mentioned so many times about Christy and how she reads her Bible every night. She's read her Bible through almost 25 times because every year she starts it again. And we're going to be married 25 years next July. So 
She read it through a few more times before then, before we got married. Open up your Bible. Read. There's always something new in there that God is going to speak through it to you. Does that make sense? Evaluate whether Jesus is Lord of every area of your life. Thank Jesus for his sacrifice and the victory that he has provided. He has provided us the victory over death, hell, and the grave. Over sin, over disease, over sicknesses. We, we, we read Matthew 24 where it talks about different pestilences that come before the end times, before the, the, before the tribulation period. Now when, it, when I see pestilences, that's not just like when we experience COVID. It's not just that. I think people are getting cancer a lot more often than they used to. To me, that is a pestilence. That is a disease that attacks people. That is one of the many things that are out there that's coming at us. There's a lady in my office who I just talked to Tuesday, yesterday, it was yesterday. She told me she'd been out for the last two weeks and then I was like, what's going on? And she finally, and she told me, she said that her, she's the same age, approximately the same age as I am. She has a granddaughter who's about three years old. She had a brain tumor, her daughter, granddaughter, three years old. She's over at the Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. They had to do emergency surgery on the granddaughter to remove the brain tumor. The tumor was cancerous, is cancerous, and had spread down into her spine where they cannot operate. So the poor little three-year-old girl had to have a port put in so that they could do chemotherapy and radiation on this three-year-old little girl. And I, I, I was heartbroken. I was like, oh my goodness. It's another one of the things that Jesus talked about. Pestilences and diseases that are coming at us. They're, we are getting close, folks. We're getting close to the end. I ain't got my jumping shoes on. I am ready for the rapture to happen right now. Are you ready? Get your loved ones ready. Share the love of Christ with them. Share God's word with them. Pray for them. Thank Jesus for his sacrifice and the victory he has provided. Seek opportunities every day to share Jesus' love with others. I was just talking to another lady at my office today. We were talking about all of the things that are going on in the world. I told her about our coworker whose granddaughter was going through this thing. And she's like, oh my dear Lord Jesus, touch this girl. And I was like, yes, exactly. And we're both believers. And she was just, she's floored. She's like, oh my goodness, this poor little girl. And she herself was al is already going through something with her husband. Her, she's the lady whose husband had the stroke. And it, it, I told her, I said, Mervat, we're all going through something. There is always something battling. And I said, it's getting closer to the end. She says, yes, absolutely, Jesus is coming back. He's going to come back. And we're going to be with him forever. We can just see it. You see it throughout the world, the rumors of wars, the pestilences, the earthquakes in various places. There's too many things going on in the world where you can't... She said it herself. She said, Jesus talked about it, and now we are seeing it. I said, exactly. Seek opportunities every day to share Jesus' love with others. As the time draws closer, all the more is the reason to share his love with others. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for this word of encouragement that you are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. You are my God, my King, yes. my Savior. You will make it personal, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming close. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being the God who we can reach out to and grab a hold of, that we can grab a hold of your promises that you will never leave us, you will never forsake us. 
You are always there with us, guiding us, protecting us, lifting us up, cleaning us off when we've stumbled. Lord Jesus, you are always there. You are always there. And we thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your provision of salvation. We thank you for your healing touch. We thank you, Lord, for your broken body that, that gives us our healing. We thank you for your blood that was poured out that gives us salvation. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for conquering the grave, for rising again three days later, just as you said. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for ascending to heaven and sitting at God's right hand. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for all that you have done in our lives, all you're going to do in our lives, and we thank you for what you're doing in our families' lives. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our friends' lives. Lord Jesus, we thank you for saving those who were lost. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for healing and binding up those who were broken and those who were without hope. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the transformation of a heart that was stone and turned into flesh, turned into a heart that is sensitive to your spirit. Lord, we ask that you would touch us tonight, that you would be with us as we go our separate ways and you would bring us back safely again on Sunday. We love you, Lord. We look forward to seeing you again. In Jesus' name, Jesus' name, amen, amen. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here tonight. There are three easy ways to give tonight. The first is through PushPay. Simply text through your smartphone, VF Assembly to 77977. The second is by going to the church website at www.vfassembly.org and click Give at the top right side of your screen. The third way you can give is to mail your giving directly to the church at 15260 Nisqually Road in Victorville, 92395. Thank you and may God bring his richest blessings upon you as you give. God bless.